Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Reihe Lecture and Film. Sie wissen natürlich, das Thema ist Selbstporträts von anderen, das Universum von Anjes Wada. Und äh, es ist uns ein großes Vergnügen, auch in diesem Zyklus, der bis Juli andauert, Referenten aus aller Welt zu Gast zu haben. Und heute ist es auch wieder ein sehr internationaler Gast. Delphine Benezé ist heute hier. Marc Siegel wird sie Ihnen gleich vorstellen. Ähm, wirklich ein, ein ganz besonderer Gast, der sehr, sehr viel über Agnes Wader weiß und sie auch persönlich kennengelernt hat. Sie wird heute zwei Filme präsentieren. Ähm, zunächst einen Kurzfilm du Côté de la Côte und do, als Hauptfilm Dokumenteur. Und ja, ähm, das Ganze ist wieder auf DCP hier bei uns angekommen. Ähm, das ist dieses Digital Cinema Package, was Agnes Wader persönlich restauriert hat, das Color Grading selbst vorgenommen hat. Und es ist ja sehr charmant, dass die Franzosen ähm, da auch alles in einer Hand behalten möchten oftmals. Ähm, dieses, äh, diese DCPs hatten vorher Frankreich noch nicht verlassen. Und deswegen hatte niemand gemerkt, dass diese DCPs ohne englische Untertitel sind. Und ähm, wir haben jetzt folgendermaßen reagiert. Also für Sie zum Verständnis, wir bekommen diesen Schlüssel dann immer erst einen Tag vorher. Und ab dann können wir testen, haben wir das gemerkt. Und wir haben uns jetzt ähm, ganz äh, etwas umständlich, aber doch professionell, äh, etwas altmodisch, einen ähm, Beamer hier vorne hingestellt, mit dem wir zum Hauptfilm zumindest die englischen Untertitel manuell einspielen können über einen zweiten Vorführer. Bitten Sie allerdings äh, um Verständnis, dass das für den Vorfilm nicht funktioniert hat. Äh, Delphine Benezé wird ein bisschen was dazu erzählen, ähm, was der Erzähler uns so preisgibt für alle, die nicht Französisch können. Wir haben wirklich alles versucht, um Ihnen das bestmögliche Vergnügen heute zu generieren. Das äh, Schwierige nämlich an dem Hauptfilm heute ist auch, dass der Passagen auf Englisch hat und die sind dann französisch untertitelt, deswegen die dachten, dass es bereits untertitelt ist. Gut, Sie wissen jetzt Bescheid rund um die technischen Dinge. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir in bester Bildqualität Ihnen die Filme in jedem Fall zeigen können und ich hoffe, Sie haben auch Vergnügen daran, diese Filme so zu sehen. Es lohnt sich sehr, gerade auch nach Les Plages dann yes. Wie immer haben wir ein Begleitprogramm, dazu und das ist in diesem Monat, ich habe es beim letzten Mal auch schon gesagt, geht es um Frühwerke oder Vorläufer der Nouvelle Vague. Wir hatten schon Claude Chabrol gezeigt, Le Beau Serge und zeigen aber auch noch am kommenden Mittwoch von Chris Marker, Lettre de Sibérie und auch einen Kurzfilm, den er noch vorher gemacht hat, Dimanche à Pékin. Lohnt sich auch sehr, die sind wirklich selten zu sehen und im Dezember widmen wir uns dann Michel Piccoli, der seinen 90. Geburtstag feiert und aus dem Werk von Agnes Wader natürlich auch nicht wegzudenken ist. Ja, viel mehr möchte ich Ihnen zum jetzigen Zeitpunkt gar nicht sagen. Ich wünsche Ihnen und uns allen viel Vergnügen und äh, bitte Marc Siegel auf die Bühne. Viel Spaß. Guten Abend. It is my contention that Varda's cinema and artwork is distinctive because of its particular mix of eclecticism and resistance, and that a thorough exploration of these notions can contribute to a better understanding of her place in film history. Delphine Benetze's highly significant 2014 book, The Cinema of Agnes Varda, Resistance and Eclecticism, is one of the first scholarly studies that brings to the breadth of Varda's work a sophisticated understanding of contemporary film and media theory and a fine analytic sensibility. The mere existence of this book, I should add, is an act of resistance, since, as I couldn't help but notice, it is only one of three books on women in the Wallflower Press series on directors, a series that now includes almost 45 titles. In her book, Benissé, focuses on Varda's lesser known works that span the director's over 60 years of activity. She argues that across this great diversity, there is a constant, not a single formal or aesthetic trait that marks all of Varda's work. Rather, in spite of its eclecticism, Varda's cinema, Benice writes, is characterized throughout by an unwavering ethics of filming. <coughs> She links this notion of ethics to Varda's encounter with the other, with difference, 
Antivarda's drive to capture and preserve images of marginality, that is of people, relationships, and existence at the margins of society. Benizé received her PhD from the University of Montreal with a dissertation on one of my favorite cities, the city of Los Angeles, as it was and is constructed across various media. In further publications and research, she continues to focus on representations of urban space, but also attends to Francophone and contemporary European cinemas and feminist and post-colonial literatures. She's currently working on a project on feminism and girlhood in the films of Céline Schiama, Delphine and Muriel Coulin, and Nathalie Simon, among others, as I've heard. I'm looking forward to her talk today, which in keeping with her project on Varda is sure to provide a useful conceptual framework for approaching and appreciating her eclecticism. Please join me in welcoming Delphine Benitze. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, the talk will be in English, I'm afraid. But you'll be, uh, from what I gather, you'll be linguistically challenged tonight, not just with my talk, but also by the disjunction you'll be able to experience between um, subtitles and images for one of the two films that you'll be seeing tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, organizing such a, a great series, an exciting uh, series of screening. Um, thank you for everyone for making me um, welcome. When I was asked um, if I could take part in this wonderful series of screenings and talks, I was elated and I thought how fun it would be um, to pick just one film or two films and to present it to you. But um, as time passed, I realized um, that it wasn't going to be that easy. Even if I'd spent time working during my dissertation on two of Varda's films shot in California, even if I'd spent time writing a manuscript and then publishing a book on her whole career, choosing just one was really a challenge. In the end, what happened was um, that the biggest challenge in tackling tonight's talk was the schedule because I have to present uh, on films that presumably not that many of you have seen before coming. So I'll be talking before an audience that hasn't seen the film presumably, but I'm hoping that some of you attended some of the previous screenings with uh, Kelly Conway and Vincent a couple of weeks ago. Um, so what I'll be trying to do basically is to give you information on the two works that you're going to see and also I'll try not to ruin the experience of um, discovering the films tonight. I want you to experience the pleasure of seeing, um, seeing an artwork in such a brilliant collective setting. So I'll, what I want to do basically is to prepare you as best as I can um, for the roller coaster that tonight's combination of film is bound to be. First, you'll be shown an exuberant uh, documentary on the Riviera, so on the south of France. And then you'll be seeing a much more contemplative and experimental fiction centered around one single female character called Emily. So I, my hope is basically that once, um, once I've prepared you, you will enjoy these two films even more and you'll be able to appreciate them for their individual qualities but that you'll also be able to consider them together and see how there are connections between these two uh, very different films in, in, uh, in looking at them together. My starting point, as you can see from the title behind me, is the space of the beach. And I owe a lot to um, one of my English colleagues, Fiona Handyside, who's written a book about the beach in French cinema. But I'd be dealing with different, um, different films than the ones she discusses in her book. 
my idea is that the beaches um, in Varda cinema reveal and illustrate how original and conventional Varda cinema truly is. Now, you may be thinking um, the film about the beaches by Agnes is not Du Côté de la Côte uh, or Documentaire. It's the one we saw last week. Um, and you'd be wrong because actually Varda's cinema has been, and her visual production, has been haunted by beaches since uh, her very first piece. In 1954, she made uh, La Pointe Courte, which um, to start with was not um, supposed to be screened. It was a personal project. It was actually a gift to a, a dying friend. So she went there and started making photos and decided she was, she'd received a little bit of money. She was going to do a film. In 2008, um, for those who've seen the film last week, she uh, made a retrospective and joyful walk down memory lane um, via the beaches of her life. But she's also used um, beaches as a, a space that's in her visual art installation uh, exposed in galleries. So it's really something that she explores through, throughout her work. And tonight, basically, I will argue that um, Varda uses in her cinema the beach as a place of liminality, um, as a connector between herself and the audience. Let's, let's have a very short experiment. Think about, close your eyes for five to ten seconds and try to summon the image of a beach and of the sea. Try to think of something somewhere you've been to or something you know. Okay. Now, can you still see clearly the image you summoned? Was it a familiar place you went to on a holiday? Or was it completely made up? Um, was it all white sand, palm trees, crystal clear waters? Or was your idea of the beach more about the wind in your hair, the taste of the salt on your lips, or maybe the sound of the waves crashing on the sand or pebbles? There is no single beach, but rather a variety of beaches and of experiences of these beaches. And hopefully by looking at beaches in these two um, films tonight will offer us a gateway to engage with Varda's cinema and with her subjective take. It will offer us an array of representations of images that are worth discussing. So before I go on proper with my presentation, I want to give you a little bit of background and it will be all the more important tonight um, because one of the films won't Ha will have subtitles, but subtitles in French only. Um, so the first, <clears throat> not the first film that you will see, but the first film that I'll introduce is called Documenteur. It was shot in uh, 1979 at a time when Varda was living in California. She had followed Jacques Demy, her husband, who had a project at the time with the studios to do a musical. And she became fascinated with um, muralists and murals that she saw across the city. She started, because she uh, trained as a photographer, she started making photos, hundreds of them, and approached Antenne 2, one of the French um, TV channels, to try to get a project off the ground. She received some backing, so she embarked on filming that particular documentary in East LA and Venice focusing on muralist. And this is not the film you're going to see tonight, but because um, Murmur and Documenteur, the one you'll be seeing tonight, are companion pieces and were meant to be screened together, I thought it would be important for you to see just a very short clip of Murmur that is supposed to go with uh, Documenteur. Can I have the first clip, please? Okay. That's a very short clip, but it sort of gives you a sense of what 
what this film is about. It's basically a documentary with Varda as a voiceover going through the city, a bit of a travelogue, really. And in parallel to shooting uh, Murmur, Varda was also working on a fiction about the hidden side of Los Angeles, the outsiders, the less glossy picture of the city of angels. The story she had in mind um, was that of an expat, Emily, who'd moved like her to Los Angeles with her husband and her son, but who suddenly found herself alone after splitting up with her partner. And the film is um, supposed to focus on Emily coming to terms with her new life as a single mother, as an expatriate, and as a professional too. She works for a, a French filmmaker that we don't get to see, but whose voice is, of course, uh, Varda's voice. Now, you, be th you might be thinking, what's the connection with the beaches? Emily's story is played against the backdrop of the Pacific Ocean, and it offers itself as a place of work, a place of peace, a place of grief for Emily. And that's where I'd like to quote my colleague, who has written a chapter on Varda, but not on these two particular films. And she explains how in Varda's uh, film, the beach is, a, is key to unraveling her sp spatial politics and art as a location which perfectly and paradoxically suits her as it is a margin made central, a home open to the outside, a very particular site which can nevertheless be a place of leisure or work, of peace and love, or grief and loss. Now, the other film you'd be seeing, and the one that won't have um, English or German subtitles, Du Côté de la Côte, is very different. It was made in 1958, during the summer. It was a commission and not a personal project. And that counts in this in, for the reason that um, at the time, Varda had only made one feature film in 54 that had been screened a handful of times because she Having done that as a personal project, she had no idea that she needed to pay a specific license to be able to exhibit it. So basically, she had to prove herself to the industry in a very uh, male-heavy, male-dominated um, uh, environment. So even if she'd earned the accolade of André Bazin and some of the critics of the Cahier du Cinéma, she needed to make sure that she was working and was paying the bills. At the same time, it's not something that she, uh, that I would argue she did without engaging fully with the topic she was given because she has made lots of other short atmospheric uh, films such as Au Saison au Château, L'Opéra Mouffe, but also L'Edit Cariatid. So it's something that she's done before and that she carries on doing. Originally, the film was commissioned by the French Tourism Office. It was made to promote tourism on the French Riviera. It was short, shot very quickly in eight weeks on site with a very small team. She was delighted because she, was, she asked for some specific um, things such as uh, tracking rails that she got. So she experimented a lot with uh, technical um, material. And the film was released in the summer of 1959 with, because at the time um, you always showed a short film and then a long feature. It was, sh it was shown uh, in 59 with Alain René's Hiroshima Mon Amour. So it was Du Côté de la Côte and then Hiroshima Mon Amour. And later that summer, it was also um, broadcasted every day for two months on French television as a screen test. And you'll understand when you see the colors, because they were trying out colors. So they wanted something that was punchy and colorful, and they used that for two months on a daily basis. So they would show Du Côté de la Côte every day to the few people who had televisions at the time, col color television. Um, so in a way, Du Côté de la Côte is a little bit like an exercice de style, an essay, an unorthodox guide and travelogue. It's a list of the various places uh, that tourists or outsiders 
might be interested in, but it's also exuberant and kaleidoscopic. It shows the mythical um, places, figures, people of La Croisette, Saint-Tropez, there's an appearance of uh, Brigitte Bardot. So she surfs on, on that um, mythical quality of the region. But it's also a deconstruction of the myth, of the glitz. Uh, she exposes the tackiness, the silliness uh, of the area, the painful reality as well of holidays at the seaside. Because we, we always think, you know, I'm going to a seaside, it's going to be a great holiday, and you end up eating sandwiches with sand and never having lovely weather, or maybe it's just in England, but she, she's, she, she gives you a real sense of what, you know, what spending time at the seaside is like. Um, so what I want to do is basically look at the sea, so the space, the songs, so the music, the voices um, uh, and the sound and the specificities of, um, of the editing in these two films and see how um, how this teaches us things about Varda's cinema. I would like the second, the th no, the third clip, please. This is the only piece you'll get with subtitles, so I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> um, but you, you see that basically this uh, film is it's a travelogue, but it's a tra it's a travelogue with uh, with a slant to it, with a very subjective uh, voice. It's never Varda's um, it's not never a Varda's voice. She uses a male voiceover character and a female voiceover character, but she doesn't um, she doesn't do it herself. But it's a very sort of irreverent and exuberant take on the Riviera. The the other film you'd be seeing, Documentar, is very very different and i'd like you to watch uh, a very short clip now so that you get a sense of the contrast between the upbeat colorful vibrant and a bit psychedelic before the age uh, du côté de la du côté de la côte and the much more mellow and melancholy um documenter can i have the next clip please thank you um, I wanted to show you this clip because you get to see three very Im important things, I think, um, in this particular passage. Uh, you, you see Emily in her workplace. So that's, the, that's basically where she uh, works for the French filmmaker. She spends her time sitting at that desk, typing memos, making phone calls, but mostly um, typing notes um, by herself. So you see that she interacts very little with people and that she speaks very little on screen. The voice that we hear is an inner monologue. A ref it's her reflections, her thoughts. And these thoughts are the only thing that um, make obvious her disconnection with life. She is, uh, for the most of the film, she's unable to forget the life she had with the man she loved. And she has a hard time adjusting to being a, a single parent. She has to deal with a new place and a new start and she can't cope. Another important thing that you see in this um, movie is that in that clip is that her story is entangled with images of others, with very often anonymous um, locals, but significant others. Others who have wives, husbands, others who work, others who are mystery, and who are to her um, potentially full of emotions and turmoil as she is. The beach here, um, it's her room with a view. It's a distraction from herself, from her suffering, from her repetitive work, and from her duties as a mother too, because it's the only place she can escape and not be with her child, as she, you know, she has no uh, partner involved in raising her son anymore. So in a way, the beach is an escapade, uh, 
it's a time for her to watch, to think, um, and also to remember. Whether it's remembering uh, the, the painful bits or the nice bits of her story. I've copied here in French um, a poem by Prévert that's quoted in that particular passage uh, because it's about two lovers who have separated and it's a very it's been um, turned into a very famous song for French people sung by Yves Montand and I think there's over 600 different versions so it was you know Iggy Pop has a version in English so it's it's one of those things if you read one or two of the lines of that poem you immediately know what it's referring to and you start humming and surprisingly she Vada incorporates it in her text in the inner monologue of uh, Emily's thoughts but she doesn't use it uh, she doesn't use the music um, and the music that she uses instead is slow paced melancholy very often piano sonatas so the film basically alternates between sequences where the music sets the tone and sets the mood and sequences where we hear Emily's most intimate thoughts and where and the short sections where she talks with her son or where she cares for her son but she has very few interactions with uh, grown-ups adults she's very very um, lonely so this is mostly what we see her doing when she's not working or in the first half of the film looking for a place to live because they live at uh, they live out of suitcases for a, a good while try to remember the clip that i showed you of uh the companion piece that was very upbeat very musical uh, it was miles away from the kind of music you get in documentaire uh, the music really creates and adds to the mood of the film. The open spaces of the Pacific Ocean um, is what she's facing. What she's seeing is openness, but what she's exper experiencing is pain, solitude and isolation. And the film is very much about her um, emotional and intimate geography her inner world. It shows her difficulties in coping uh, with life. It shows how she's overwhelmed by grief and how she barely functions. So it's not really an upbeat um, piece. The, the, the other people that we get to see in Documenteur are, as I said, anonymous Angel Angelenos. Um, and very often they make visible the fact that she is on the verge of being disenfranchised, disenfranchised. Up, to about the, up to the first half of the film, she's basically moving from place to place to place because she isn't able to find a landlord who will let her rent a place with a child and a part-time job. So we see her, uh, we see the tedious, repetitive litany of her days, typing, looking for a place, talking to her son, trying to keep him happy, trying to find a place. And she feels torn and she feels raw, and she's trying desperately to keep it together, to go on and to find a solution that would work for both her and her son. But until she finds a house and a shelter, there's, a, there's a, an obvious sense of lost unity. Something is missing in her life, and that's something that she sees outside. So if you could show the next clip, you get a lovely um, example of Delorue's piano sonatas and, an, and a further example of Emily's inner monologue when she's um, thinking about what she's missing, 
or what she's lacking. Can I have the next clip, please? Now, I realize I may not be the best PR for this film because I'm selling it like it's a really depressing <laughs> film about a single mother, but it's not completely... Um, I, I said to you I didn't want to tell you too much about the story so that you can um, be surprised and experience it for yourself. Um, and we do witness Emily's overpowering emotions and her struggles. Um, but I would say that overall she, over, she manages to overcome the situation and that she is looking for some help. Interestingly, in other um, female characters, there are two that stand out and they are Millie on the left, uh, a shop assistant who she never talks to, but whose elaborate hairstyle sooth soothes her. So when she feels desperate and really at a loss, she goes to that shop and she watches Millie work and she feels better. And the second is Tina, the lady that's leaning towards her over the bar. She's a waitress and she's also uh, a mother who's divorced and who will help her uh, settle in her new place, will offer uh, her some advice. She's the only one actually that she um, really talks to and confines in. So we only see her two or three times in the film and it's very short sequences, but she's, she's one of the two lifelines for Emily. Um, and she's a, I'd say she's a significant companion. She's the only person that she can relate to. Um, I'm going to refrain from discussing the, the end of the film or the film, you know, or the narratives trajectory because I don't want to say too much and I won't give you information about the ending of the film but I will say that there is a shift from Emily's subjective geography from the dissolution she feels at the beginning to a more peaceful and a more quiet and a much less melancholy uh, ending and the fact that Part of the ending takes place on a beach with her child who remarks that it's at the very end that it's lovely to hear her laugh again is telling of the changes she's gone through. Now in the other film, Du Côté de la Côte, and I'm jumping um, a bit abruptly here, um, as I said, you could look, it's almost like the flip side of the coin. Um, it's playful, it's, an, it's very essayistic in tone. It's very much about Varda's take on the, 19, the late 1950s and the leisure revolution in France. Um, when she sh shoots in 1958, uh, it's just been decided that people will have a third week of holiday every year. So it's, it's a big uh, change. And du côté de la, in Du Côté de la Côte, Varda encourages the, the audience to engage with um, the opposition between the natural and the codified. And she's looking at the behavior, the images, the sound that are associated with the Riviera, or what we think is associated with the south of France, because you might have a different, um, you might have a different set of stereotypes associated with the south of France. But in, in a way, she starts by stating facts, as you saw in the short clip that I showed earlier. She uses statistics, she uses recognizable sites, um, and she does so to highlight the highly artificial and made up nature of the Riviera. She shows how it is a myth that's been constructed. So she um, deconstructs what the Riviera means for people. In a way, she um, tries to be a cultural historian and she looks at the traces of the making of the Riviera. She will use um, vintage posters in the credits in the beginning. Um, she will dig up facts in uh, tourist guide and uh, and 
film them in a humorous way. Um, at the same time, she doesn't really, I don't want to make it sound like she takes herself too seriously. She looks at the fun facts. Um, she focuses on fashion, for instance, on colors, on what um, some historians would call low culture when she paints, for instance, the latest trends in terms of color. Um, and here she worked with Delerue uh, again. She uses Delerue's upbeat melody to support her humorous take on the ever shifting trends. One year it's yellow, one year it's blue. The only ones who don't abide by the rules are usually the Germans and the Brits, as you may have guessed. But she's, you know, she's very careful in the kind of stylization that she does of the beach, and she shows how uninterested she really is in making an authentic documentary. She's not creating something that's meant to be authentic or to show what the Riviera look, really looked like in the late 50s and in the early 60s. She's creating a dazzling and exuberant visual and oral composition. She's making fun of ourselves, of our longings for a time of rest, of our longing for a holiday, of our time away from our daily grind. And she does so brilliantly, you know. She, um, I'd go as far as to say that she is asking us to reconsider our own experience of the holidays at the seaside and that she makes references to films the audience might have seen at the time, like Mr. Hulot's Holidays. Uh, and it's not just the colors, it's also the tone. So it's not a social comedy, and it's not structuralist like Tati uh, is, but there's a sense that she's making fun of uh, things. Uh, it's an elaborate travelogue that prompts us to reconsider the mundane aspects of our holidays while simultaneously recognizing the attraction and the lure of such a fantasy. Because why would we go on holiday on the Riviera otherwise? You know, if we knew this is really what it's like, nobody would go. So I would not call, I know some, there's been Historians and scholars haven't written much about that piece, but when they do, they often they often um, go one way or another. They say it's cynical, it's snobbish, it's highbrow. She's just mocking working class people. And I don't think she is. I think it's an attempt at looking at the true beauty of an area that she grew up in because she, uh, as a teenager, she moved to the south of France uh, during World War II and lived there for a while. And it's also an invitation to look anew and to acknowledge our own emotional investment in space. It is a way um, to connect with our audience and a way to open up a conversation that will carry on in her subsequent films. And I, and I like, and if you remember only one thing of what I've said, that's what I would like you to remember. I'm gonna show you a last clip um, from Du Côté de la Côte, and I'm sort of hoping that I did um, pick a clip that's subtitled. It's the very end. And I think in the very end, you realize, yes, it's not a perfect, marketing pitch for the Riviera because it shows you that it's all in our head, that there is no paradise, that we make the paradise we want to see. But it's also acknowledging that um, you, invest, you can invest space in different ways, with art, with life, or by just being there. So could I have the last clip, please? And I will finish on that. Thank you. Yeah, 
Thank you, Delphine, for this lecture. And uh, yeah, we are looking for the films. But first, we have a short break. Zuerst machen wir noch eine kurze Umbaupause. Das Filmcafé hat auch noch geöffnet und durch den Gong werden wir gleich wieder signalisieren, wenn es weitergeht, wie Sie es gewohnt sind. Bis gleich. Please welcome again Delphine Benesse and Mark Siegel. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, that was such a fantastic film. I'm just completely blown away. Uh, oh, you're waiting for us is to dance the polka, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was happy with mariachi. <laughs> um, um, Delphine, maybe um, just to step back to what you talked about and the beach, um, the beaches. Um, if I recall, um, you said that the beach in Varda functions as a space of liminality and that it's a, a, a point of connection with the audience. Um, whereas here, it, it seemed to me so much a point of connection um, Oh, I think we should move more to the center. I think I was told that. Um, um, it seemed more a point of connection um, with um, with other people, with the difference, with with the the surroundings. Um, those things may not be separate from one another, but I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about about this. Well, to me, it's sort of. Um, in this particular piece, the beach work says, you know, it's it's a backdrop. It's something she. It's a place where she has, where she can think, where she's by herself, where she's away from responsibilities, whether it is, you know, looking after her son or finding a house. And it's also a place where she can um, look at other people and try to understand what it is that she feels, what she feels like and how it is that other people don't look like they can feel the same um degree of pain and pleasure that she does it's almost like you know connecting with the others through that not being able to because she's unable to communicate with anyone but mm -hmm. um i'd argue tina and her son in a way the beach is almost something she has to push against like herself to sort of emerge at the end of the film and and reconnect with herself and with life, I would say, because I, I don't think, I mean, you may disagree with me, but I don't think the ending is, is um, depressing or the, I think the, it's not a happy ending, a classic happy ending, but I'd say it's, it's pretty upbeat or as upbeat as can be, considering the circumstances anyway. And so uh, I, I, I had to keep thinking, and as you're speaking, thinking of the title of our series, Self, um, Self Portraits of Others. Um, and and in some, I don't want to push that idea, Vincent Hader's wonderful um, yes, idea for the say. series, but I, but, I, um, but I do think here, of course, with the film itself, and we who heard Kelly Conway's talk, you know, know or saw Le Plage d'Agnès, know about. Um, what Agnes Varda was going through at this time, we hear there's this wonderful moment where where we hear Agnes Varda's voice, which is meant to be the voice of it's Emily. Of but Emily, but it's you only hear uh, Varda's voice in the very beginning, so the opening before we realize before there's a switch to the the inner monologue. So she introduces, you know, on the pier, the very uh -huh. sort of first 10 minutes when she explains that she can't make sense of life, that the words have lost their meanings, that she's looking for a way to uh, get over that pain. This is Varda's voice. And then there's a switch. And, it, and from then on, it's only Emily's voice. Until that section where she, she's replacing her her boss basically so she's replacing Varda where she's asked to record um, the voiceover actually of Mio Mio the other film on that was shot at the same time so the companion piece mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, Which we'll see later in the series. Yeah, actually. and when they replay her voice, of course, it's not her voice; it's Vara's voice. Right. And I, I, I told you earlier, but I didn't tell you when I was ex um, sort of unpacking what I thought the f films were about. Is that um, um, at the time of making the film, Varda was not only in Los Angeles, but she also for a while um, separated she was for a while separated from um, Demi so they weren't living together so obviously there's a lot of baggage and a lot of uh, there's an a, uh, when you know the details of the biography when you know they were mm -hmm. together they, they left together and then they didn't stay together for a while and then they got back together and moved back to Europe you, mm -hmm. you sort of realize suddenly it's not just a story about separation others um the fact that you know los angeles appears to foreigners and maybe outsiders like this you know the ultimate um epitome of manifest destiny of you know succeeding of the you know it's the west it's as far as you can go before you um face the ocean and there's nothing left it's also a, a, a place that has a particular resonance for uh, varda as as an individual because it's probably where she had to face uh, uh, serious difficulties, whether it was um, in terms of work, because she'd, she'd gone to LA also to work, but didn't manage to find any backing in the States in terms mm -hmm. of uh, finances. But it's also a place where she had to sort of work things for herself. So I mm -hmm, guess decide mm -hmm. where to take her career to the next level or where to take her life um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from then on. Okay. So it's, you know, it's interesting that you would, we're not, I'm really hoping that you stay and come to other um, screenings and that you'll come and see uh, Mio Mio because it's a, it's a lovely um, film. And I'm sure that the, the scholar who will be presenting will, will tell you a lot about Los Angeles, but yeah. it's a, it's a really nice. Um, it's a nice combination to see these two films. Oh, great. I th let's open it up for some comments already. I see Vincent Hader. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again for the talk and for, for programming the two films. Uh, and uh, latching on to what you just said, uh, for someone who has trouble getting funding for her films, she was immensely productive in California because, I mean, the, the, that's one of three feature films she made over there, plus a series of shorts. Uh so it's as if she could not not be productive. Mm. And if, if you look at the films, I mean, this is something that, that struck me again in both these films. She's not capable of not creating an image. You know, every single shot is an invention and is, is something to discover, if you will. Um, and uh, this made me th think about... You know, in, in, in the text, in the announcement text for the series, we create sort of an analogy between her and Godard as being the, the two intellectual heads of the Nouvelle Vogue at a certain point. Uh, and um, I just want to pursue that parallel for a little while because uh, Godard is also someone who's very interested in beaches and liminal spaces. Uh, I mean, he's been living on a beach for 40 years now and working on a beach for 40 years now but even if he travels he always ends up in hotel rooms that go out on on the ocean and um, so what interests me is uh, the, the beach as a, as a space of creation as 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 you said you know it's a liminal space a marginal space it's a space that uh, creates a lot of openings um, but it's also a space that apparently is sort of inexhaustible in terms of creating possibilities for creating and inventing images. Um, and I wonder if, if you see that along the same, sli same lines and if you, you know, if, if you think the, the, the parallel to Godard is somehow productive. Well, to answer to you first... I don't, by, by which I don't mean to subsume Godard mm. in any way, uh, but as uh, Valda in any way on the Godard's work i mean uh they're very different still i think one thing that varda does throughout her career is really because once you've seen or for the book i had to re-watch every single film and i think she really she strived with 
limitations and difficulties. So you're saying, I, I get what you're saying that, you know, she didn't have backing or she had a little money from that French channel, but she still managed, you know, being her own, managed, she managed to do these two films. She also did, you know, Black Panthers in the, in uh, the States. So she was particularly productive, but I think she's, she's particularly good at um, working with limitations. Um, one of the uh, um, at atmospheric shorts that I mentioned earlier, L'Opera Mouffe was made with the limitations of having a, having a cable from her house and not being able to pull it more than, you know, I can't remember if it was 90 meters, but a certain distance from her house to record the sound as she was filming. And she managed to do a lovely, a great film just, just being stuck with that. Um, Thing, she couldn't change anything about it. So when you watch um, Du Côte de la Côte, it's the same. You know, she's got all these crazy tracking shots because she had these, she had these tracks. And she wanted to use them. She wanted to see what they, what she could achieve with them. So I think she, whether she has money, um, she was lucky that she set up her production company early on because she didn't find backers, and she thought that you know the first film that she made in '54 was financed with a bit of an, uh, an inheritance and a cooperative. So she, she asked basically all the actors and all the technicians not to be paid and was hoping they'd get some money back screening the film, which never happened. So they basically worked for free. But I think she, she she's, she's great at working with the limitations she has uh, the, and they vary and they, they change according to where she is or, or where she finds herself. As for your um, second question about Godard, I'd say it's it's funny that you mentioned that because a lot of um, historians usually pack her up or sort of push her towards René and the Rive Gauche in terms of the new wave films. But say so she's much more of a, she, she makes, you know, to me, she makes essays and she thinks with images and sound and music. The song at the end of Du Côté de la Côte, she wrote uh, many of the songs that you will hear, that you will have heard in Cléo de saint Cassette, she has written. So in a way, she's, um, she's trying to create, she's very experimental and she's trying to create something that's a hybrid between texts, word, poetry, images and cinema and that's where i guess sometimes she doesn't meet her audience because it's you know it's not mainstream enough and it's not experimental enough so she's sort of in that i guess uncomfortable middle but i think that's where she's also particularly interesting because you can as a, as a spectator you can make connections with people like godard or with people like rené or with even, you know, more experimental filmmakers. Who Kurt Krenn. I, yes. I thought the whole time on Kurt Krenn's um, famous film, The Austrian Structuralist um, uh, TV, mm. of just looking out the window. That's so why I thought it was so funny. The kid always says, we don't have a TV. And I was like, you look out the window the whole yes, day. Yes, you like, don't need a TV. <laughs> take a chill pill, yeah. Mm. Did, um, there was another question. Over here. Um, well, first... Thank you uh, for your inspiring talk and for your choice. I'm still very fascinated by the beautiful, really beautiful colors of the of the travelogue of the first film. But my question would be uh, on the second, on the documenteur. Um, there were, I think, two uh, recurring images or uh, recurring themes that I'm still thinking about and would be interesting if you could mm. elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, there was uh, the sex scene of the, mm. the couple, of course, and the, the uh, kid... Um, Asking about uh, yeah the 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 couple that has uh, split up and his own origin if you want to put it that way and then there was that that beautiful scene that that Mark just mentioned the the view behind the typewriter uh, outside towards the sea and uh, with that uh, wonderful cadrage and um, that was really stunning and um, I would be interested if you uh, could say something about how she includes that recurring images inside her narrative and mm. uh, what do you make out of that? Okay, I, I sort of, thank you for that. It's it's sort of giving me a chance to, I didn't want to sort of um, repeat anything that was in my book, so I 
flipped aside all the sex <laughs> scenes and but basically um, um my way of interpreting the sex scene is that basically or the nude scenes because i don't um i don't necessarily um I don't want to separate the sex scenes from the nude scenes. I think the, the, the two nude scenes with Tom first and her then in mm -hmm. three times when there's parallel editing between her son being at home by himself and her being at home and occupying the space of her boss, um, to me is significant. It's where it's also when you pay attention to um, the sound and the music, that's where the, the inner voice stops. So after that nude scene, uh, by herself in the bed in her boss's bedroom that's where suddenly it stops so that's when you don't you, you may not realize the first time you see the film but that's when you stop hearing her thinking and that's when she I think she takes control again of her life and decides that she may be still aching from the lost love she is she still feels uh, sad about but it's also you know the time when she decides we can be sad and then we can dance the polka or you know mm -hmm. it's there's a time for everything and and that's also coming back to your question about the sea that's also the time she stops typing that's when you see the typewriter without her hands that's where you see the typewriter without hearing the keys being used and that's when I, I think she sort of reappropriates that, you know, that's when she, f she turns the page and, and I guess decides she can carry on working or not. She can decide whether she's going to have a lover for the sake of having a fun afternoon or not. And she says no to the, you know, to the easy um, afternoon on the waterbed. And it's the time when she she can i guess also enjoy her sons without feeling like she's she's trapped and she's she has no way out of the because her son is pretty uh i mean you if you have children you understand that you know they they are they can be quite needy and in a situation like that where she where they've separated and obviously it seems that her husband doesn't doesn't play a huge role in the in the beginning of the film it's it's understandable that her son needs her and asks a lot from her but at the same time you can you can see that she's she's already having a hard time coping with her new circumstances let alone deal with uh, a young child who's you know i need you desperately and i need you to sleep with with me in the same room and I, I need you to hold my hand all the time so i'd say um I, yeah, I wouldn't separate the nude scene from the sex scene, and in a way, I think they're they're a nice way to show that she's she's overcome the difficulties she had in the beginning of the of the film. I think it, it also seemed um, just to add it was for me quite shocking and exciting. It was the one time that she seemed to look at herself. I mean, looking in the mirror and not just simply looking out at the world. Mm. At the same time, I don't want to, 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 I think looking out at the world was what enabled her then perhaps to actually finally look at herself. But that was for me quite mm. significant when we see that she's in this mirrored room. Since so many of the shots were quite spectacular, this is something we've been pointing out the past few weeks um, of Varda's kind of reflections in mirrors and in the, the kind of surfaces, the screen, using the, the kind mm. of glass as a screen, fen um, a window as a screen. Um, so yeah, I yeah, no, just wanted to add that. You can definitely there. tell she, t she, she trained as a photographer. I mean, she, mm. her editing is perfect and her shots, you know, her, um, not necessarily the moving shots, but you know, the food, the still shots she makes are just magnificent. Like, uh, I always feel when I make presentation, I always feel bad when I free, you know, freeze frames with other filmmakers. But with Varda, I have no <laughs> concern whatsoever because you can tell she's, you know, she's planned it so well. The reflections, the the division of the mm -hmm. screen, you know, with Emily in the center and the two panels where the the sea reflects back, or when she mm. sees the 
uh, the gleaners on the beach or, you know, the people who are picking up the garbage. It's like everything is so uh, elaborate and sophisticated. And I've, I've probably seen the film, I don't know, 10, 20 times now, but every time I see it, there's something I haven't noticed, you know. It might be melancholy, it might be sad, it, make, it might make me cry or make me, you know, depressed if it's not a good day. But there's always something that I get to see that I didn't see the previous time, so... Uh, so another question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, another thing that we mentioned the last few films was uh, the game like a um, play like structure in the films that we had. And I unconsciously um, thought about the first half, which, which was sad, but a sad game, which she played with the words and commenting on the people she observed. Mm. And then um, this game structure seemed to be not as um, the same way in the second half after this what you pointed out i didn't notice myself but uh, when she there's no voiceover anymore mm. so yeah is it linked and it gets a traje uh, trajectory into some direction and development maybe um, and it's less like a game but more like a goal mm. she has can you i think I to <laughs> me it's sort of you know it starts with poetry and it's great for the audience but in a way past a certain s stage she doesn't need the music of the words she doesn't need the poetry she can she can live her life and she doesn't need that constant, you know, it must have, I'm trying to put myself in her shoes, it must have been exhausting to have that, con you know, that inner conversation because she's very shy. You can, you can see when she, the few interactions she has with grown-ups or friends or acquaintances, you can tell she doesn't, apart from that phone call, she really doesn't want to say much about her separation with her uh, lover, uh, which, who also happens to be her husband, you you, you realize when she's um, recording the voiceover that they were married. Um, but um, I, I also, you know, I, th I think she, she, you don't need the words as much when she's, when she um, reappropriates life as it is. And she, in the beginning, she, she quite um, rightly says it, you know, before the separation, she lived her life. She was folding uh, clean laundry. She would do chores. She wouldn't be thinking about those chores. She, she didn't feel so disconnected from herself. She would just do it. And she didn't think it was such a repetitive, tedious, uh, painful thing to do. And she's hoping one day she, she says, you know, I hope one day I'll get back to that stage of not not thinking about the difficulty of the daily grind. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's where that that's that's why I think that's where she's at at the end. And that's where the to me, the last image is like almost a reflection. You know, she's the sun is in the middle. She's a single mom on the I'm trying to think on the right. Is that right? Yeah. She's on the right. Yes, she's on the right. And the young girl that she could have been or that she must have been who's waiting for her date is on her left. You know, it's almost like the past, the present mm -hmm. and the future. So, you know, she was a young girl. She got on a date. She fell in love. She had a child and then mm -hmm. she moved on and she's happy with herself being single and unattached. So to me, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the nicest me metaphor that can be for um, single people. May I ask just one quick thing, and we'll come back to more questions. Um, the just I'm thinking about nudity, another link with nudity. I'm trying to understand. I think we'll probably be coming back to this, but um, if we think to the first film, if I recall, the the first shot of nude bodies was at the end, when with my stumbling, fumbling fringe, it seemed to be that Varda was sort of making a distinction between the garden and the beach, mm. and the garden was linked to nostalgia. Well, and, a, the and Eden, Eden is the Garden of it's, Eden. But can you talk a little bit more about, is, that, is this something, is that just simply there related to the Garden of Eden? It's not like a general distinction between gardens and beaches? Yeah, I think there's and a how double, does nudity play a role? I think there's a double play at the end, but that might be more than just, you know, double layer. But I think it's, of course, the Garden of Eden, so Adam and Eve and, you know, um, but it's also, uh, what, what are the, the, the most uh, appreciated um, gardens in France, you know, French gardens are are, are like hedges trimmed to the 
<laughs> to the millimeter. So in a way, it's sort of uh, we've looked at how the Rivera and the myth and ha have how, how everything's tied in together, how it's been constructed. I'm trying to show you this is my my take on Eden and and the paradise is more you know two um, nude people after presumably having had sex or having enjoyed time together by themselves and not in the crowded not on the crowded beach of the of the of Cannes or on that sort of island. Um, so to me, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a double take on looking back at the construction of and the fakeness of mm -hmm. this idea of a paradise, of a paradisiac holiday mm -hmm. location, and also looking at um, with a bit of a satiric um, gaze at, you know, gardens, what's a nice, you know, what is a beautiful garden, mm -hmm. if it's... If it's uh, if it's left to its own devices, is that, you know, would we appreciate beauty in something left, that's left alone mm -hmm, or would mm -hmm. we not? And mm -hmm. for someone who's uh, who's looking at, who's composing images so carefully, I think mm -hmm. she'd probably find her. She, I think she uh, welcomes um, uh, unpredictability and chance when she films, but I think she really, she's, she's uh, quite particular about the way she composes her images mm -hmm. and how she edits sound and music in combination with those images. Thank you. Are there any final questions or comments? Just wait. Oh. Ah, the closed doors. Yes. I'm still struggling with this. The closed one. doors in the first film, the closed yes, gates. Yes, yeah. Uh, I of. I'm still struggling with this one. I'll be honest. I I don't know if it's um, to do with the fact that she. Um, it's hard for some of you guys. I realize because of the missing subtitles, but she um, there's a whole section where she makes the. Um, she, she highlights the contrast between those who have money, who can build these crazy villas with turrets and you know palaces and those who can't because they they spend uh they, they spend 49 weeks of their year earning the money they're going to spend on the camping lots um by the cemeteries on the riviera so i've i don't know if it is about the haves and the haves not or if it is more uh straightforwardly uh the end of the summer and the fact that, you know, uh, you never, you rarely get to see the Riviera in the winter or when it's uh, off season. And that's something, I think that's something that she's also interested in because it's so seasonal. And so, you know, you, when do you ever see uh, films or, or uh, anything on TV about can, but that, you know, two weeks of the year where everyone gets there for the festival so i think she's interested in this in the seasonality and the temporary uh, character of the of um the riviera you know how how it is that we sort of i guess project so much but for such a sh short time i never consider because the carnival as well that she films in nice is a is a really big thing for people living in the south but it's in the spring so barely anyone but locals go to that carnival and if you ask any french person they might have heard about the carnival in nice but they'll think that usually carnivals are in the north of france so that it's you know that's not regionally something that's uh frequent so i i to be honest the doors i'm still i'm not sure what it is about and i've also wondered whether because the first door she closes has rosalia which is the name of her first daughter Rosalie on it. So I was wondering whether it had anything, any sort of particular personal uh, significance to her at the time of the shoot of the filming, but I, I wouldn't know. You'd have to ask her when she's coming. So come and ask her. <laughs> <laughs> April 14th. <laughs> any other questions or comments? I hope you had a good evening. Yes. Good. Yeah, I, th I think if people are still here, they must have had a good <laughs> evening. <laughs> um, great. Well, um, please join me 
or thank you first for staying and participating in the discussion and join me in thanking Delphine Benetze for this thank wonderful you. presentation. Thanks. And also thank you to Mark Siegel, of course. And I want to remind you that on the 3rd December, it's going to continue. Katrin Peters will be here and yeah, will the most famous film of Agnes Wader vorstellen, Cleo de 5 a 7. Then also from 35mm from the Institut Francais. It's already there, don't worry. Nice to be back. With the subtitles. With the subtitles, yeah. Cheers. <laughs>